if you have a Bible and you want to f- kind of follow along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to be talking about Jesus' parable of the wedding feast. Jesus' parable of the wedding feast. Now, the parables, of course, are uh, stories that Jesus told to illustrate or highlight or even sometimes to obscure or hide specific points. This one's more of a, an illustration or kind of an explanation about what the kingdom of heaven, and he compares it to a wedding feast, hence that name. Uh, and we'll uh, get to that in just a moment. Uh, kind of, I have a big idea for you today. It's this. The parable of the wedding feast shows God to be both gracious and discerning regarding who he allows into his kingdom. The parable of the wedding feast shows God to be both gracious and discerning regarding who he allows into his kingdom. If you're following along in your sermon notes, which are in your bulletin, there's some fill in the blanks for you. Your very first one, your point number one is this. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to an important royal celebration. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to an important royal celebration. Uh, We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to start out by reading verses 1 through 4. Matthew 22, starting in verse 1. Matthew 22, 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready Come to the wedding feast. So it begins with Jesus explaining the kingdom of heaven. And in a parable, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a feast, a wedding feast for his son. The kingdom of heaven celebrates. Because that's what a wedding feast was. It was a celebration. It was a huge, days-long party. Right? We talk about our weddings today and we're like, yeah, we'll go and we'll go sit through a 20 minute, maybe half hour service. And then after that, we'll hang out at a reception for maybe a couple of hours and have cake or whatever. And then we'll go home. We have no idea what a party looks like. If that is what our idea of a party is. Because when they would gather for a wedding feast, it would last. There's obviously the wedding, the ceremony, the the moment of union of one man and one woman. And then, days long, like three, four days long, they would party about this union. Because it was a beautiful and a wonderful thing. It was something to be adored. It was something to be celebrated. And so, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who put on a wedding feast for a son. So this is not just any wedding feast, right? This is not your commoner wedding feast. This is not, hey, Bob and Susan have gotten married. Let's go hang out with them for a few hours. This is the king has a son, and that son has gotten married, and now we're going to have this magnificent party. And so the kingdom of heaven points to a king and his son, first and foremost. The king is God the Father. The king is God the Father who puts on a wedding feast for his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And this is the picture that we are meant to understand as we approach this parable. The kingdom of heaven celebrates God the Father's son, Jesus Now, the Bible uses wedding language elsewhere to describe the intention of God toward his people, right? You go all the way back into the Old Testament and where God says, I have stretched a canopy over you. And that canopy was a wedding canopy that God says, I've made this relationship between myself and yourself. 
between God and his people. And it was a picture of a wedding. And so the picture of the wedding of the Son of God is a picture of the wedding between himself and his people. So we would call that the church. If you go to read Ephesians chapter 5, and it talks about this is the relationship between a man and a woman. It's what it looks like. And the husband loves his wife, and the wife loves her husband, and all of these things happen between them. But then Paul turns it and he says, but I am actually talking about Christ and the church. I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. So this king likes to party, right? And he throws this massive wedding feast that would be not just... I mean, if we talk about a three-day celebration that just the average person would hold, imagine what it would be like when a wealthy king throws an extensive celebration for the wedding of his son. This would have been a huge deal. This is big stuff that's happening here. But then there's this really weird turn that happens. So the king sends his servants out and says, all right, all of these invitations have been sent to the people that should come and enjoy this wedding feast. And so the servants go out to c collect these people and bring them to the wedding feast. But they keep getting, no, 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 sorry, I'm washing my socks that day. I can't come. I've, I'm busy. No, I would, no, I'm, I, I just can't make it. Sorry, I got too much on my plate. This is an absolutely ridiculous picture. The king invites you to the wedding feast of his son, and your response is, nah. No, it's, it's, it's meant to be absurd. It's meant to, for Jesus' original audience to hear this and go, wait a minute, they did what? They didn't go? Are they mad? Are they out of their minds? Are they foolish? What, what is the deal? Why would they not go? So that his servants go to call those who are invited. The scripture is the invitation. And we who bear the message to come are the servants. We who bear the message are the servants. We invite people. We tell people about Jesus. Did you know that all people are born broken and bent away from God by nature? And all people need Christ. We tell people that. Because that's the greatest human need that exists. That is the greatest human need that exists. And all other things ought to drive us and point us toward that. But there is this moment when the servants come and they deliver this and say, all right, it's come, it's time to go. But the scripture says, but they would not come. This would be unimaginable unimaginable to reject the offer of the king. Nobody would miss out on this. It would be considered a grave insult to refuse this. A grave insult to say, no, I don't want to come. I'm not interested. Yet people reject the invitation of God every day to their peril. Every day people say, nah. But God is inviting. God is calling and he calls through his people. He calls through you, through me. He calls to people and says, this is, this is the great kingdom of God. You have been invited. You have been called. Please come. This is a celebration. This is a good thing. And you are called to participate in it. Will you come? And sometimes we get a yes, which is always really exciting. I don't know if you've ever shared the gospel with somebody and had them say, yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. That's a cool thing. And sometimes you share the gospel and somebody says, nah. And it's a little heartbreaking. Because you know it's for the best. You know it's for the most important thing in the world. And then the king says, well, maybe they didn't understand. So he sends more servants out. Look, he says, look. The dinner's ready now. It's waiting for you now. One of the things that both Jesus and John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah, said was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's 
here. It's available. It's prepared. It's ready. Come. This is, the, this is what the wedding feast, the servants for the wedding feast are telling the people when the king says, the dinner's ready. It's now. Come. Show up. So he sends these servants out again. And he says, you know, it's not just any old dinner, you guys. I've killed fatted calves and oxen. Now, if you were to go to a celebration of significance, of of your average everyday kind of level of significance, they might slaughter a fatted calf and have the meat from that available. Because meat was not something that was readily available to everybody at any time, right? They didn't just run down to Fred Meyer and pick up some steaks for the grill on 4th of July, Right? They didn't do that because meat was a delicacy. It was an expensive proposition to, to gather around and have some meat. So maybe at a decent-sized celebration, they would kill one fatted calf. This king says, I have killed fatted calves and oxen. Lots of meat. The, the, the denotion here is that this is an amazing celebration. This, the wealth that got poured into this is unparalleled. And the point is that the kingdom of heaven is fantastic. There's nothing that parallels it. There's nothing that comes close to a comparison of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's big. It's amazing. It's important. It is. And as you read through the scriptures and find descriptions of the kingdom, they're always like hard to comprehend because they're so opulent and amazing what the kingdom will be like when it is fully and finally established on the earth. Right? The kingdom, we, we're actually participants. If you're a believer, you're a participant in the kingdom presently. You are a subject to the king. Jesus Christ is your kingdom. The kingdom is in some sense now it is already, but there's a greater sense in which it is also not quite yet. It's already, but it's also not yet. It's been inaugurated, but it has not been fully consummated. So there's this coming uh, expectation of an amazing fulfillment to this promise of the kingdom. It will, uh, you know, we struggle. We've got problems. We've got difficulties. Stuff hurts. We make mistakes. Lots of problems come. We stumble. We fall. We sin. We repent. Hopefully we make up. We, we try to do that which is right, but we're not. And we say this a lot, right? It usually is an excuse. I'm not perfect. Yeah, of course you're not perfect. You're a sinner, <laughs> Right? But you're also saved by the grace of God for something amazing. A great kingdom that is underneath the rule of the great king. And we talk about politicians and we argue about which one's better. Which one are we going to vote for? I like this one. Well, I like this one. But we always look at even our own candidates and we kind of go, hmm, there's something to be desired there. And if we don't, we may have an idolatry problem that needs to be addressed, right? Because none of those people are Jesus. He's the perfect king. Okay, I don't care which side you fall on at this point. Jesus is the king. Fall on his side. He's the good and perfect king. He's the one whose wedding feast we're talking about celebrating here. So Jesus compares this kingdom of heaven to an important royal celebration. It's big, it's opulent, it's amazing, and we're inviting people to it. Right? We're inviting people to it. Number two, God shows grace by continuing to extend the invitation, but God will not be patient forever. God shows grace. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. God shows grace by continuing to extend that invitation. But he won't extend it forever. There is a termination point here. We don't know when it is. It will be sudden whenever it occurs, and it will be obvious and recognizable and noticeable when it occurs, but it is not yet. It is still going. So God shows grace by continuing to extend the invitation, but God will not be patient 
forever. Matthew chapter 22, and I'm going to read verse 4 again, but then I'm going to continue on through verse 10. Verse 4. Again, he sent other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. All right. So again, he sent other servants. God extends grace to sinful humanity. The whole gospel is about the grace of God. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God, even though he sees our brokenness, even though he sees our sin and rebellion against him, still extends the opportunity to be saved, to be changed, to be made new, to be cleansed, to be repaired and restored and one day resurrected, like Christ was resurrected. He still, even though we are in many ways opposed to him, still extends grace to human beings who are rebels in their lives. God extends grace to sinful humanity by patiently allowing opportunity to repent and receive Christ couple of passages I want to take us to very briefly here. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So the Lord is patient. The Lord is forbearing. He's waiting. He's trying to gather in this full number that he desires, right? And then Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. You know Jonah, the prophet who did not want to go and preach repentance to the city of Nineveh because he didn't like them, because they were his enemies and the enemies of his people. But God said, Nineveh, Or he said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach to Nineveh. And he went, no. And so he got on a boat that was going in the other direction, basically headed to Vegas, right? He was going where he ought not have gone. God didn't put up with that. Caused this great storm to attack the boat. He realized it was his fault. He had the people throw him overboard. Great fish swallowed him. Good times there. And then the great fish vomited him on the shore of Nineveh. (sighs) I guess we're still doing this, he says. So he goes to Nineveh. He preaches repentance. And they repent. And he's like, why? And he's mad, right? He's mad. So he goes up. He sits on a hill and he watches Nineveh just in case God's going to smite it anyway. And God doesn't smite it anyway. But God has this conversation with Jonah after the fact. And this is what Jonah says in chapter 4, verse 2. And you can kind of imagine him saying this upset, I think really helps. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and a bounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And he's mad about that. But he's right about that. God is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and he relents from disaster. This is God. This is who God is. He's a patient God. He's a loving God. Now, 
There's more to say than that. But that's an important, you don't understand God unless you understand at least that first part of it because that's the basis and foundation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because God didn't have to save any of us. He didn't owe it to us to save us. We got into the problem. We stayed in the problem. We compounded the problem. We made the problem worse. We do so on a daily basis in a lot of ways. But God in his grace looked upon us and said, I'm still going to work and save you. We're still going to do something about this. We're still going to do something about this. And then it says, with the, the parable of the wedding feast, so the servants come a second time. They, they remind everybody, all right, it's, it's the wedding feast is on. We're going to go. It's here. It's ready. Come. But then it says, they paid no attention and went off. So some of the people who were invited, they paid no attention. They heard it and they went, nah. And they turned around and left. Some people reject God passively. Some people reject God passively and just sort of like, nah, I'm out. And, and self-select out of that and just say, I don't, I'm not interested. By ignoring God and by ignoring his servants, they reject God. It's still a rejection. It's still a choice to say no, but it's also still a rejection of God. So some people reject God passively. But then it says the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Others reject God actively. Others fight against God, fight against those who bring the truth of the gospel. Others reject God actively by confronting and combating the message and the messengers of God. There are people who do this today. There are people who have made it their mission to undermine Jesus Christ and the church and the gospel of Christ. Have you ever heard of the name Richard Dawkins? One of the, quote, four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse. You know, Richard Dawkins, uh, Sam Harris, um, can't remember the other two clowns. One of them is dead. Um, regardless, people who actively fight against and actively seek to undermine and actively seek to say no and we're going to try to stop you from doing what you're doing. Right? And that's the, the, the atheist part of that. The, the, the clear and uh, kind of like the Western version of that rejection is fairly tame, to be perfectly honest. Because there's another form of that active rejection that we'll find sometimes in America, not often, but we'll definitely find in other parts of the world where things like persecution happen, right? People are actively killing Christians today for sharing the gospel. Like, today. People are seeking to kill, to silence Christians. It still happens in lots of places. It happens in the Middle East. happens elsewhere. It does still happen happen today. It's an active rejection of Christ and the messengers of Christ. So the king is obviously not happy about this, because now he's not just been insulted, he's essentially been attacked. So it says he was angry, understandable. And so he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. God's patience does have a termination point. It does. God will not be patient forever. Now, for some people, that termination point is the day that they die, right? You die, you don't get a second chance. You don't get to get on the other side of it and go, oh, well, I guess now I believe. No. The, the scripture says it is appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. Okay? Okay. That's how it works. That is simply the reality of the situation. So he sent troops and destroyed those murderers. One day it will be too late to turn to him and accept the invitation of grace. Now for some people, like I said, it's the, it's the moment they die. For other people, at some point in the future, Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to return to establish his, his kingdom. And when he does we have this moment of the final judgment where the books are opened up 
and those who have received Christ enter, and those who have rejected Christ are rejected because they have never received and they have actively rejected, which is two things that happen. All right? So one day it will be too late. And then the king says, okay, so these guys aren't coming, obviously. But what I want you to do, he says to the servants who remain, I want you to go out into the the highways. I want you to go out and I want you to find people, average people, common people, regular people, and I want you to invite them and I want you to bring them in. Now remember, Jesus has been contending with some fairly strong critics at this point. And everybody who's a critic of Jesus is the kind of person who should have been one of the kind that was invited to the kingdom, or that would be the expectation. But what do they do? They reject the messengers, and they even reject the son. So Jesus' response is, so go out, go gather people, gather them up, bring them in, just Go find any kind of person and invite them. This is not a class thing. This is not second class citizen thing. This is the kingdom is for any kind of person. The kingdom will repair any kind of person who comes and bends the knee to the king. Who says yes to Jesus Christ. Who receives the grace on his terms. So go gather. And they gathered all that they found. It's interesting, it says they gathered all that they found, both good and bad. So like the parable of the sower, where the, the farmer goes out and he just indiscriminately throws that seed wherever. Like it's not in just a cultivated field, but he's on the side of the road, he's among thorns, everywhere. It's sort of an indiscriminate go out there. Or in the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, where an enemy came in and sowed uh, some weeds among the wheat to try to mess up the harvest for his enemy. There is this moment of let it grow together, and then we will gather it and then separate. This invitation is indiscriminate, but it, not every result will be a positive one. Sometimes false comes in. Sometimes fake comes in. That's just the way it works. Number three, while God is gracious, he is also discerning, and he will not overlook addressing those who have not been made right for his kingdom. While God is gracious, he invites any kind, says, yeah, all of you, come, come and receive grace. Come, Come and receive the goodness of God. Yet he remains discerning because there are people who come but still have not come, in a sense. They, have, they, 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 they put themselves in among the party, but they're not really part of the party. They're part of something else. Right? And so we actually see that in this next bit because God is discerning and he will not overlook addressing those who have not been made right for his kingdom. Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 through 14. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So the king goes in and he's hobnobbing with the guests. He's looking around, he's meeting the people. And he sees in this wedding feast, this royal opulent wedding feast, somebody who is not, quote, dressed for the party, right? He doesn't have the appropriate attire on. Now, it doesn't say why, but the implication is because he refuses to. The implication is because he doesn't want to. This is no superficial matter. It's not, it is an external way to indicate 
complete fitness for God's kingdom if you're dressed in the right way. Now, this is not, hey, dress nice for church, everybody. That's superficial. That is an external thing only. What's being discussed here is very similar to what we find in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. Looking at verse 11. Verse 11 says this, Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their, full, uh, their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Talking about people that Jesus is allowing into his kingdom, it says he's given them a white robe. Now what's up with a white robe? The white robe signifies the cleansed situation of that person, somebody who has received Christ, somebody who has said yes to Jesus, somebody who has had faith in Christ, and not just that intellectual, yeah, I believe there was a guy named Jesus, but yes, Christ, I trust you with my life. Yes, I believe in you. Yes, I receive you. Yes, I receive you and the cleansing that you offer. Not of myself, not of my own merit, not of my own power, but by your grace alone. So when we talk about this guest at the wedding feast who doesn't have a wedding garment, the picture that we're supposed to have is somebody who has, in, he's showed up, but he's actually refused the invitation. He's actually said, yeah, I'll be there and I'll benefit from the party, but I don't care about this king or his son. I'm not interested in this king or his son. So the king, obviously upset by this, comes up to the guy and says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Now, it's very interesting that he begins with that word, friend, as he addresses this person. And there's a subtle thing, I think, that's going on here. Because when Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus Christ and leads Jesus, or leads the soldiers to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus addresses Judas, this is what he says to him. Friend, do what you came to do. This is traitor identification. But it's, it's interesting because the way in which he addresses it is not, but it's even in the address of this person who doesn't belong is this season of grace friend, why are you here without a wedding garment? Because there's an implicit invitation in that. Because the king probably would have supplied the wedding garments. And it's this one last ditch moment of, come on. But the, the man is speechless, says he doesn't have anything to say. He doesn't have anything to say. Friend, how did you get in here? So this is a rejection. This man, this person, whoever it is, has rejected the king to his face. This isn't like the people who just simply didn't come and ignored the invitation. This is somebody who stands, looks the king in the eye and says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put that on. So the, the response from the king, bind him hand and foot. Cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Elsewhere in the Bible, this is the precise description of hell. And it is tragic to be that close to the king to look him in the eye and still say no. Because some people reject passively, but some people reject actively. This is an active rejection. This is somebody who says no to the king's face. And the description is a description of hell. It is a brief picture of the everlasting misery reserved for those who reject salvation. This is hell. And then we end with this last statement. 
for many are called and few are chosen. Nominally, responding to God's call to salvation is not the same thing as acceptance. Just saying, yeah, I'll show up. Yeah, I'll come. It's not the same thing as save me. Save me. This is what is happening here in this passage. True acceptance requires a response of faith and of loving God. God, you are good. You have done everything to save me. I have contributed nothing to this but my brokenness and sin. That's what I bring to the table. But in your grace, you have saved me. You have offered me salvation. So I respond in faith. I trust you. I entrust myself to you. This is what it looks like to receive the gospel. To say yes to Jesus with your whole self and say, save me. For the kingdom of God is like a wedding feast. It's a big royal celebration. It's a good thing. It's an amazing, opulent moment. It's this invitation to something we cannot even begin to imagine how good it is. And if you're here today and you've not received Jesus Christ, I suggest accept that invitation. Receive Christ Say in your heart, God, save me because I need it. Save me. Save me. Because I cannot save myself. I don't have the power. I don't have the ability. I don't have anything but a need for you, God. Save me. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ to me. And there's no magic formula. There's no, you have to run through and jump through all these hoops. It's simply entrust yourself to Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of the kingdom. I pray, Father, that we all would live in light of this great celebration, that we would be a people who are celebrating all our lives the goodness of our king and the wedding of his son to his people. We thank you, God, for giving us this grace. We pray, Father, that we would be mindful of you always, that we would be inviting others always. We pray that those who we invite would receive. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.